It's uh, great to be here. Uh, it's great that this is one of the four themes. Um, and uh, I think it fits quite well with the Charlie's introductory comments about um, looking backwards a bit and trying to address some of the known deficiencies, um, but also looking ahead. Um, and in fact, it's quite interesting to me that the title of this is GDP and Beyond because there have been initiatives in the past, and some of these initiatives do go back a long way, which actually talked about beyond GDP. Subtle difference. Um, but, uh, and perhaps it's a bit like Andrew's uh, challenge to us of thinking, what is all this for? Um, so, uh, for example, Eurostat, uh, the EU, uh, must be, I don't know, 15 years ago, had a project called Beyond GDP. They changed its title to GDP and beyond um, for reasons that I can guess at but don't actually know. And similarly, of course, there's been new impetus in the last few years, particularly from the Stiglitz and Fatusi report um, at the end of the last decade, which has been picked up by a lot of countries. And one of the things that's been interesting about that is that you know, we can ask ourselves, why do particular ideas get traction at particular points in time? And there's certainly been po political interest from around the world in the notion that GDP, um, it's not a criticism of GDP, but um, GDP was never able to answer some of the questions, particularly in welfare, um, that, uh, that policymakers and citizens want to be able to answer. So about distributions, about the household experience, about the contribution of women and men. So um, a lot of initiatives, again it fits with John Pullinger's uh, notion this morning of international cooperation and collaboration being important, but Anne's absolutely right, but don't wait for them. Um, and this is a, an area where I think um, ONS and the UK um, has been a very active participant. I've been asked to give a plug for another meeting here at the RSS on June the 15th um, called New Statistics for Old, Measuring the Wellbeing of the UK. Paul Allen and David Hand, I can see David is here, I haven't seen Paul today. And again, a reflection of the extent of um, work and interest in these ideas that goes beyond just the official statistics community, which again is another theme of today. So we've got two speakers. Um, the first, Diane Coyle from Manchester, who is going to speak. Her title is GDP and Beyond. And then Ju Yu Tsu, um, from the Centre for Time Use Research at Oxford, who's going to talk about the value of unpaid work um, and probably the value of time use surveys as well, I should think. So, Diane. Um, talking about beyond GDP has a very long history, in fact, dating back to the founding debates about the definitions of GDP in the national accounts. And I think Jill is right to say that this is something that has gained momentum since the uh, Sen Stiglitz and Fertusi report that was published in 2009. And not just among statisticians and economists, but also among people. And I found myself in the surprising position of facing audiences of uh, 200 pensioners at the Bath Literary Festival talking about GDP and economic statistics. There is something in the air about this at the moment. And one of the downsides, and echoing something that Hassan said earlier about the uh, creative sector, is that there is just a huge proliferation of, of things that people want to do that go beyond GDP. And that's a bit of a problem. Um, part of the debate is about whether you want a single index to replace GDP in some sense. And there are people who say that's vital because this is part of a political debate and in that debate, it has is keep it simple, stupid. You can only have one number that people will pay attention to. So we need to change GDP or come up with another index. And these have a very um, distinguished tradition too, going back to Tobin and Nordhaus, the measure of economic welfare, the human development index that so many people um, respect and use. But as Martin Revalian points out in a really good paper, they all have implicit trade-offs contained within them. In the HDI, it's the value of one extra year of life is much lower 
in poor countries and in rich countries. And the great thing about GDP is that those trade-offs are very explicit. We know exactly what valuations are being put on things because it uses transacted prices. And um, especially post Sen Stiglitz Fatusi, there's been much more emphasis on having a dashboard instead. And these obviously have their appeal. You can get lots of things that you're interested in into them. There are lots of them. They all have lots and lots of indicators in them, and it's very hard to make any sense of the information that they give you. Um, so if I can just a sec. Uh, here's the OECD's Better Life Index, which is one of the very nicely presented ones. You can go to the website, interact with it, and it's presenting you the information as country, trade, uh, country rankings. And the trouble with this is that you can kind of get out of it any answer that you put into it, that you want to put into it. So I've done two alternatives here. I've made myself Scandinavian. I've dialed up the weight on all the things that Scandinavians care about, the uh, uh, community, environment, uh, work-life balance, civic engagement. And not surprisingly, the Scandinavian countries come out top in the rankings. And then if you make yourself very Anglo-Saxon and you're into income and, and uh, 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 jobs, then you get the United States at the top of the ranking having been halfway down or a little bit below in the top panel. So how do you interpret and use these kinds of visualizations, especially when they all have um, a, a different data series in them and a, and a proliferation of data? And that points to some of the real strengths of GDP and perhaps why it's still GDP and beyond rather than just beyond GDP. It's got really strong analytical foundations. The economics community uh, understands them and they're widely shared. It's an international harmonized standard. Standards are very powerful. It's hard to move away from them, but they're also very useful. So that's a, that's a great thing. People are very familiar with it. They might not understand exactly what it means, but it's part of the conversation that we have and part of the way that economists understand the economy and have been using it for all that period since the Second World War to understand how do economies grow, how what might we make people better off. So if we're going to talk about going beyond in any realistic way, then we need to think about how can we um, replicate or provide through the beyond measures some of these strengths of GDP. But why might we want to do it anyway? Why is there a popular interest in doing something else? And I think the answer must be a strong sense people have that the gap between what GDP measures and some uh, true sense of economic welfare is getting wider. It's always been there. GDP has never been um, a, a measure of all welfare. It's never been able to measure the consumer surplus from new innovations. Um, but is, the, is that wedge getting wider is the question. And I think there are reasons to believe it might be. Um, here are some of them. One of them is income distribution. Now, going back to basic welfare economics, as soon as you aggregate, you are making distribution part of the story. There's no distribution-free measure of social welfare but we've kind of ignored distribution. And this chart here is just a reminder at how much the fortunes of different income uh, quintiles have changed, have, have uh, diverged over the past generation. So that's a big part of the story that has been missing. There is sustainability. GDP is a flow measure. It's based on Keynesian in the moment short-term theory. Doesn't even care about the distinction between consumption and investment. Doesn't capture sustainability. And we see now in all kinds of environmental measures the price we're paying for not having paid attention in economic policy to sustainability. So we might want to measure natural capital, and I'm on the Natural Capital Committee. We might want to think about um, infrastructure capital more than we have. I was very struck on Hassan's map of the um, digital startups, the digital economic activity, how absolutely that sits on top of the two main broadband backbones in um, the internet backbones in the United Kingdom going up each side of the Pennines. Um, we might want to think about um, how we measure human capital as well and put um, uh, uh, more thinking into that. There's leisure and home production, and um, that was always a debate. I was quite struck when I read, first read Paul Studensky's 1958 book describing the history of GDP to that point, that he said, well, we all thought, or the majority of us thought, that it ought to be in there, it's just too hard to measure. And obviously, we very got used to that situation of it um, being too hard to measure. But I'm not going to say more about that because that's the next presentation. Then there are all these um, uh, questions about digital that the last session was touching on. That how are we measuring digital goods properly? To what extent are we 
just not capturing quality changes and can do a better job? To what extent is it consumer surplus from innovations that we never were able to capture? And if so, has that changed? Is it less than it used to be, as Robert Goulden says, or, or more than it used to be? If you think about GDP as a measure of economic welfare, however imperfect, its welfare properties depend on assuming um, perfectly competitive markets and no externalities, but one of the innate characteristics of digital goods is, my goodness, there are externalities, and um, these, these demand-side spillovers, and also supply-side, we're in an information economy, and it's a public good. There's no reason to expect that you'd get efficient in the economic sense outcomes um, from uh, market realizations when you have th these kinds of characteristics of demand and supply. We've got increasing returns to scale all across the economy. We have intangibles, something Jonathan um, has put a lot of work into. We've got this thing called gross domestic product. In an intangibles economy, what is the product and how do you even define that? Are we thinking about productivity in the right way for a services economy? What about variety of goods? In GDP, more is better. It doesn't matter that there's more variety. Is that simply a phenomenon of increased consumer surplus that we don't really need to think very much about? Or is it something that we ought to be tracking in some way? And then, not a minor point, although the last on this list, the question about globalization and these extended supply chains that all um, uh, businesses plug themselves into now. And um, I would very much agree with the question that came up earlier about the distinction between manufacturing and services not being very interesting anymore, and the geographical um, uh, lens that we want to put on, on uh, economic activity is changing too, I think. Now, these are, you could see this as a long shopping list of things that we could try and do better, but I think there is, it's not just about the statistics, stupid, it's actually about the economic thinking that goes into this. And I think economists have a lot of work to do. I very much echo Charlie's introductory comments about that. And this is a, an issue that came up in a debate I had at the ONS about natural capital measurement. And the ONS has been doing great stuff trying to start measuring the country's natural capital. The government's committed to leaving it in a better state uh, when it leaves office than when it arrived in office. And the economic value of any woodland is pretty small. It's beautiful, but it's not going to show up as a very large number. And when you add up lots of very small woodlands, you get a number that's still quite small. So the total natural capital of the woodlands in the country is not, not great. But what's the system value? What would the, how, would, how ought we think about the value of um, having woodland at all? And is that system value something that we need to start thinking about? And perhaps not in the woodland example, but in the biodiversity example, or um, uh, thinking about uh, catchment areas, you need to be able to think about that adding up problem. How do you, how do you value systems in natural capital? And I think there are lots of welfare economics questions in this Beyond GDP agenda. What is welfare economics for an information-based, intangible, globalized economy that takes distribution and sustainability seriously? That's really quite a big question. And these valuations as well. How do you think about valuations and aggregation when you've got these large network effects and, and, and externalities? So that's for the economists. Then we need to think about um, data, is there more data that we need? Time use data might well be one of them, I think, not just because of the old home production question and should we be valuing that at all, but also because time use is becoming an important question in the digital economy with that blurring of the boundary between uh, consumption and production that's occurring there. Um, and then we have to do the consensus building. I very much agree with the sentiment in the room that Anne's, uh, Anne launched that we need to um, uh, be, at, be at the fo on the forefront of that and not wait for the consensus to happen. But you do need that consensus because standards are powerful and important. And also have that public conversation. Just to finish where I started, people are interested. And as economists and official statisticians, if you don't respond to the kinds of questions that people have about what's happening in the economy, we're going to start losing legitimacy. And th uh, the statistics are just too important as a public good to allow that to happen. So the public conversation has to go on as well. Thanks very much. So I'll be focusing on mostly on unpaid work and time use survey data. So what's included in GDP? Hmm, I can go on and on the list of things that are included in GDP. But let me, let's, let's go back to the time when we were taking the first introductory um, economics class. 
the textbook says uh, or explains that the something that has to be included in GDP, it has to be included. Uh, it has to be something that is actually produced, right? It has to be something that isn't used to produce something else, right? Intermediary goods are not included. Um, and it has to be produced here, not elsewhere. And until 2014, that something also had to be legal. So there are a lot of things that are included in GDP. But as you may know, um, fall 2000, in, in fall 2014, Eurostat advised the members' countries to start inclu uh, incorporating illicit activities in their national accounts, including drug trafficking, prostitution, and illegal alcohol, and tobacco sales. Okay, the goal was to make, um, make it easier to compare the GDP across nations. Um, so for, ex for instance, the Netherlands already accounted the cash generated by, the, by the, um, the legal, by their legal marijuana sales in their national accounts. And Germany, where the prostitution is legal, they already tailed up the money from it. So why not? <clears throat> but aside from the interest um, in uh, cross-border comparability, perhaps the shift that came about uh, from the recognition that not counting illicit activities provide probably an incomplete picture of national economic activities. So then one might think that um, a similar logic might apply to other activities that are not accounted for in GDP currently, which is unpaid work. So the proposition that unpaid work, uh, which is housework, can be valued as a phase of re resistance mounted on three grounds. First, while household um, production is relevant to thinking about well-being and how, uh, standard, standards of living, it doesn't give a rise to wages and uh, salaries. Second, it's uh, too difficult to measure, as Diane explained. And third, where measurements have been attempted, the resulting estimations are too crude to be useful. However, what's clear is that the size of unpaid work is um, qu quantitatively large. I'll, ex I'll explain this later um, more in details. Now it's not too difficult to measure unpaid work, the number of hours devoted to unpaid work uh, using the available time use data. And in my opinion, it's a hard to imagine a worse estimate than the current value of unpaid work, which is zero. Unlike the core systems of national accounts that has a long history the practice of valuing unpaid work is relatively new, yet I, I found some 19 countries that made an attempt, and um, all 19 countries used at least one of these um, data sources. And among 19 countries, 15 of them used uh, time, time use survey data. And this is the list of 15 countries that used the time use survey data to, to value the unpaid work. Conducting time use surveys has grown at an exponential rate, as you can see in the, this graph. There were 87 conducted in the, there were 87 surveys conducted in the first decade of 21 of the 21st century, and we are on our way to even faster growth now. As an example of one recently completed a survey. Let me introduce you to the UK 2015 time use survey data. The Center for Time Use Research at Oxford con uh, conducted and collected the, uh, the time use data with the support from ESRC. It is national, nationally representative data survey. And the youngest age of the respondent was eight. And the survey asked for two full days of responses to questions like, um, what you were doing, where you were, what else you were doing, and um, who you were with. And there are two new elements 
included in 2015 um, UK Times data, which I think are very relevant to hear um, today's discussion. And one is an enjoyment question. Um, so respondents are asked to um, ask how much they've enjoyed their activities uh, scaled one to seven. And I'll show you another one right here. So this is uh, an example of a pa paper diary. Sorry, we are doing this um, uh, old school type of surveys, but um, this is where we are at this current level, but we are d developing an app and we are developing an um, online survey questions that make it easier and then cheaper to get the time user survey. But anyway, so this is an example of a time, uh, the, the paper diary. The first column here, is the time, and the activity is uh, recorded by 10 minute intervals, and respondents record the primary activity when uh, primary activity, and then secondary activity they, they were also engaged in, and whether they used any device, like a smartphone, um, tablet, or computer, and location, and who they were with, and enjoyment. Okay, this picture provides a snapshot of how uh, people in the UK spend their time on weekdays. I love this picture, one, because I made it. Um, <laughs> well, two, it's almost like a piece of abstract art, <laughs> I think. Um, the patterns depict the, the daily rhythms of weekdays. By the way, it's actually remarkably similar across countries. Um, so the way this uh, figure works is that you start on the left-hand side at 4 a.m. in the morning. And what are most people doing at 4, 4 a.m. in the morning? Yes, sleeping. So most people are sleeping. In the graph, almost 100% is represented by green, the dark green area. The dark, uh, the green area is asleep. And 6 a.m. in the morning, people start waking up. A small percent of people go to work at 6 a.m. in the morning, too bad. Um, paid work is represented by the blue area, and unpaid work is represented by the red area. And what happens when morning progresses? More and more people go to work and do housework, and then in the middle of the day, people take a break for lunch. The gray area in the middle, uh, that is the percentage percentage of people who are eating. Then percentage of people, go, uh, people working increases, then around the 10 o'clock at night, people start going to sleep again. So what's vivid here in this graph is the red area that represents unpaid work is, um, is a similar or almost the same size as the blue area that represents paid work. It's a, just a way of illustrating this point that unpaid work is quantitatively really, really large, and therefore it's worth and significant enough to, to uh, try measuring. It's the same as the previous graphs, but for weekends. I love this graph again the same, for the same reason. Um, and on, week, on the weekend, the majority of employed people don't work. So therefore, now we see the blue area, which represents paid work, has shrunk as compared to the previous graph. Yet unpaid work has not shrunk. It's more or less the same as the previous graph. So using, so, okay, now we have a look at the one representation of uh, how important how, uh, how, how big the unpaid work is, the size of unpaid work is. So now we are wonder, wondering how we can use this time use data to value unpaid work. I've done that. Um, using the UK 2015 time use data, I define unpaid work as a sum of the following activities, so child care, adult care, cooking and cleaning, doing laundry, home repairs and maintenance, shopping, gardening, pet care, and so on. Then, using the input valuation method, which is um, based on this idea that how much it costs to hire somebody to do the job that your, your mothers or yourself is, uh, are doing at house, in the house. 
So based on that method, I used the replacement uh, wages from the annual survey of hours and earnings from ONS to get the annual value of uh, unpaid labor. The imputed labor, imputed value of unpaid labor I have here is 615 billion pounds, which is about the 30% of uh, 2015 GDP in the UK. Again, this figure is only represent the value of unpaid labor, which is only one component of the total output of uh, unpaid work. So what do, what do we need to do to go beyond from this? We need, to continue, we need a continuous effort to collect the timings data. In the UK, the data was collected in 2000 by ONS, and it was not updated until 2015 by the Center for Timings Research at Oxford. We need a more frequently conducted timings surveys to go beyond. Alongside the more frequent and regular surveys, in my opinion, we must start combining time user surveys with the, with the surveys of income and consumption because there are trade-offs between the two. So we've seen the trade-offs. If you earn less market income, you need to do more of non-market work, right? Or if you do less non-market work, you need to spend more money to buy substitutes to outsource for that work. So this is a tremendous limitation of most time user survey data in, in that they don't include any links to those data about consumption and uh, household capital. Although it does have a links to income, but, okay. but in my opinion, this is a really ne necessary next step. Where time use data is collected, we need to harmonize them in order to improve international comparability. I realize that this is a daunting prospect it's taken more than 50 years to get countries to agree to the systems of national accounts, and yet there is a still a lot of disagreement in there. So attempting any measurement effort of this scale will not be quick or easy, but I think it's, uh, we need to start, and we need to, we need to start right now. And I also should note, however, that merely conducting time user surveys is not enough. For measuring unpaid work, the time surveys themselves are also limited by a um, range of conceptual and analytical problems. For example, the definition of unpaid work in general and care work in particular has to be broadened and redefined <coughs> or refined. My own re uh, recent research has focused on the importance of including supervisory care time in estimating the burden of care for children and infirm and elderly adults. And, but by doing, by devoting more energy to conducting time use surveys consistently, we'll do a better job with a greater accuracy. Within the quality of time use data improved and strengthened these way, in these ways, they provide a stronger basis for analysis that help address the objections I mentioned earlier. And surely the estimates that come from these efforts will be no less reliable than, for example, the kind of guesswork um, involved in estimating the street value of a heroin. Well, I can't avoid making an observation first. Sorry, there's a microphone. Uh, I can't avoid making an observation first that James Mead, who uh, invented national accounts and refused to measure what his wife was worth and then say he couldn't afford to keep her on. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but You're living to, dangerously here, Martin. <laughs> this was a long time ago, I'm quoting. Uh, but uh, no, uh, it seems to me one issue of GDP and, of, and beyond, and particularly when one changes definitions of capital and introduces the forms of capital that depreciate very quickly or fairly quickly, is that the difference between gross and net becomes much more material. And you know, whatever the shortcomings of net measures of product as indicators of welfare, they must surely be less than the shortcomings of gross measures as indicators of welfare. Of welfare. Okay, do you want to comment? Uh, I, I agree with that, but I would add it's just as true of some conventional forms of capital now because some of those have much shorter asset lives too. Oh, I agree. Um, 
this is really in response to Diane's remarks, which by and large I agreed. As I, I'm personally very much in the uh, GDP and beyond category rather than the beyond GDP category. But I'd like, I think it would be helpful if we could distinguish improvements which would be essentially extensions of the, or uh, better uh, measurements within the existing framework and possible expansions of the framework. So um, within GDP itself, um, we can, for example, obviously people are now concerned more about inequality than they were 10 years ago. And, and one reason for that is that ri any rise in productivity that's occurred doesn't seem to have benefited a lot of people, or at least in some countries that's true, not in all. Um, so therefore we do need to drill down and um, uh, concern ourselves with how GDP is distributed as uh, well as with how, how it um, um, comes about. So that's one point. Um, and I don't see that as kind of revolutionary, that's evolutionary, really. Um, and similarly, some of the issues about um, uh, quality uh, and variety could really be ad addressed by a wider use of the hedonic method for constructing uh, price indices. Uh, and it may be that will revise our view of, of economic processes generally. For example, it might be the case that capital growth would become more important as opposed to productivity growth in accounting for any rise in living standards that we enjoy, assuming we do eventually enjoy some more, um, because uh, it could be that we are, uh, because we're not taking proper account of the increasing variety of capital goods, we're understating the, uh, the contribution of capital to economic growth. Um, I, I agree with you, Nick. And Actually, we've had four separate sessions, but these issues all overlap, and there's a lot of overlap between the uh, question about better uh, city or regional statistics <coughs> and um, these, these beyond GDP issues, because they matter for all of those polities as well as nationally, um, but also particularly on digital. I think there's a lot of overlap between the issues in the session before ours and, and, and this one too. And I don't, I don't know... Um, where I think the distinction lies between we could measure this better because uh, we're not doing the hedonics properly or actually this, this is some kind of qualitative change that we might or might not want to measure but it's not in GDP. But I think the, um, there, are lots, there are lots of great statistics already that the ONS has produced for addressing some of these issues, particularly the environmental issues, great environmental satellite accounts uh, compared to what we had some years ago. I think the language of satellite accounts is really unfortunate, mm -hmm. actually, yeah. because nobody, t nobody pays inten any attention mm -hmm. to them. So part of what the Beyond GDP debate is about is um, uh, drawing attention to some of the things that we already do know and saying they do matter to people. And I was trying to think of a metaphor that would replace satellites. The only thing I could com come up with was a, was a constellation. We don't want a dashboard with about 57 different varieties of, of statistics in there that people can't uh, read very easily. But maybe we want a constellation of four or five things which would include distribution and would include something about sustainability and, uh, and might include uh, digital change or not. Thank you. I think that's a, a really important point, but there's lots of hands, so I won't join in. There's one over here. This is a great session. Uh, my question relates to the unpaid work. Now, um, so because of the digital revolution and the digitization economy, uh, do you think that the uh, amount of the unpaid work, uh, the size of GDP, that uh, uh, is growing over time? Or <coughs> so, um, because there, there is a substitution for paid and unpaid work? Yeah, the, uh, the total time of unpaid work has decreased significantly um, since 1960s, when there was still time that you need to wash your, you need to do laundry by your hand or by your feet. Um, but that's why I can only say from the perspective of, of the time changes, because we don't really have a measure of a household capital. So if we have a household capital measurement, then we can link um, the people who have uh, two, I don't know, refrigerators 
will be more productive or they spend more time on cooking or la or or not cuz they just buy a lot of bunch of stuff from Tesco and then just stuck it in the refrigerator in in two refrigerators so but i think unless we have the the better measures of uh, household capital we wouldn't be able to see that uh, change okay thank you there was another one at the back as well Thanks. Well, great presentations, Bully. Thank you. And, and the chart I love. But um, y y while I, I think it's, a, it's obviously a fantastic idea to try and measure the contribution of unpaid labour, it immediately begs this question of the rigid boundary between what's unpaid labour and what's leisure. I mean, I notice I think you put shopping into uh, unpaid labour. But I mean, some types of shopping clearly are kind of dominated by the pleasure factor. And of course, if, if, <laughs> it's true, right? Um, and, and, that, and the same is actually true of, of, you know, so many of these activities. Where does the, you know, cooking, is that for pleasure or is it a, a unpaid labor? And, and in fact, what we think of, what is conventional paid work for many people has a pleasure element to it. So, I mean, there's actually, there's both a measurement problem here and a kind of philosophical, whatever you want to call it, that strays into the whole kind of well-being sort of area as well more broadly defined. So I'd just be interested in sort of just comments and thoughts on that. So um, I used the term, I used the definition of unpaid work based on the, this notion that if you can pay somebody to do the work for you, then it'll be counted as work, right? And the shopping, yes, but paid work also generates a lot of uh, happiness. So we can't really say because shopping for, for, for example, your clothing um, makes me happy or, or makes me sad or, or, or vice versa. <laughs> I, I think it's a, it's, a hard, it's a hard sell, but I know, but it's uh, important to know, note that the happiness it doesn't matter in this um, terms or in this definition that I used. Thank you. There's another one at the back. Thank you. Um, I'd like to really ask about GDP. I, I mean, to be fair, GDP has been an incredible success. And it, it isn't that old. It's maybe 50 years old which is not, not that long when you're my age. The, the thing I'd really want to ask is we've been trying to draw, I, let me say I'm from tourism statistics and tourism satellite accounts. So the thing we've been trying to do is get a lot of people in say the tourism industry to actually measure in terms of value added rather than producing lots and lots of statistics which uh, are interesting but they don't easily, easily fit into something like the national accounts. So. That's the first question is what happens to them, especially if we start to get a new measure? And the second question is, the new measure, is it going to perform as well as GDP, which I think really showed its strength in things like the after the global financial crisis, the, the numbers coming through really made people realize, my goodness, there's something terrific happening. Okay, thank you. There's a lot packed into that, that, that question. Um, I'm always a bit skeptical about industry claims um, to how much value they add to the economy because you never know quite what counterfactual you're comparing them to and it's always, I don't know, five billion or, or something. It's not a very informative kind of exercise in my view, I'm afraid. Um, and I'd, I'd rather have the detail myself. And I did start out with a slide saying GDP has many strengths and one of those strengths is absolutely that it's rooted in um, well-understood economic uh, theory and um, until we have uh, something that kind of replaces that, that analytical strength, I don't think we will have a new indicator an, uh, or beyond GDP. So I would frame this debate in terms of GDP and beyond because I don't think we're at a point where we can leave it behind yet. And yet, and yet I think it's becoming de decreasingly fit for the economy. The gap between what it's doing and what the economy is doing is, is, is increasing, is my sense of it. 
and it's partly for all of the uh, digital things that are covered in, in that chapter in, in Charlie's report, and it's partly for some of these other issues like the, the time use and the unpaid work that perhaps we should always have paid more attention to, and, and people are becoming more aware of that now, or becoming more aware of environmental degradation. Um, so I think I'm agreeing with you, apart from uh, doing special tourism, tourism's uh, value-added studies. <laughs>